Good evening and welcome. Berkeley time means that 7 o'clock actually is 7.10, 6 o'clock is 6.10, so forth. This is how we operate, but I think we should begin. And I want to thank everyone for coming to this event. And uh, let me just say a couple of things before the event itself begins. My name is Jack Citrin. I'm a political science professor here, and I'm the director of the Institute of Governmental Studies, which has been sponsoring and is continuing to sponsor in cooperation with the law school and other units on campus, a series of lectures and conferences on choosing the president, campaigning, and governing. And we've had a number already, and I want to thank Dean Edley of the Law School for sponsoring this event with us, and also to encourage all of you to keep up with the forthcoming events and, and attend if you are interested. Uh, I'd like to say a couple of things about the format of this event and then turn over, turn it over to uh, Professor Yu and the speakers. Uh, the first thing, of course, is the standard, please turn off your cell phone. So, you know, as if you're in the movies. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that we will, we try, we're going to have about a half an hour for questions and answers. We're going to, these cards have been distributed. Please, if you have a question, write your question on the card. They will be selected and then passed on at the end of the speaker section uh, to, the, uh, to the moderator who will direct the questions to the speakers. Um, Okay, I hope I don't need to say this, but I am gonna say this. This is uh, Berkeley, this is University of California, Berkeley. We're an academic institution. We believe in free speech. We believe in respecting the spirit of free speech. We respect the right of protest. There seem to be some people who are here who are expressing a pr protest of their own, and that's great. However, during this discourse, we are going to insist on respect and decorum, and I hope that everyone in the audience shares those values, because it's the only basis on which an academic institution can survive. And thank you for respecting that in advance. Let me now move to what you came here to, he to talk about. This panel is part of a series of uh, talks about what the new president, whoever she or he may be, will have to confront. One of those issues, obviously, is the relationship between the president and the judiciary and the impact of the judiciary on our national life. And we're fortunate to have a wonderful set of people to discuss this. I'm going to introduce the person very briefly who organized this panel and who uh, will be the moderator. That's Professor John Yu, who received his BA, summa cum laude, in American history from Harvard, and his JD from Yale Law School, where he was the articles editor of the Yale Law Journal. He's, cl he's clerked for Judge Silberman of the US Court of Appeals of the DC Circuit, and then for the Supreme Court, where he clerked for Judge Justice Thomas. He joined the Bolt faculty in 1993, and has been on our faculty since then, while taking, uh, also working for some years as the general counsel of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, and then in the office of the legal counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice. His main areas of expertise are constitutional law, uh, security law, and international law, and he has published widely in those areas. So John, I'm gonna leave it to you to introduce panel and to take it from here. Thank you. Uh, I just want to begin by uh, saying, as my uh, colleague Jesse Choper asked me to say, uh, to make clear to the audience that uh, we're not here to talk about uh, my prospects to join the Supreme Court. Uh, Jesse's of the fervent view that that will never happen in either of our lifetimes. Um, so let me begin by introducing the panel. We have, a, I think, a really outstanding uh, panel to discuss this important topic. 
uh, the future of the federal courts and the 2008 elections. Um, the first speaker, and we're going to go in alphabetical order, the first speaker is my colleague Jesse Choper, who is the Warren Professor of Law and the former Dean of the Law School from 1982 to 1992. He clerked for Chief Justice Earl Warren, uh, is the author of two important monographs and two uh, casebooks used throughout the country, uh, is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, and most importantly, uh, was just uh, nominated and appointed to the California Horse Racing Commission. Ah, <laughs> he's the guy I want to know. <laughs> Uh, to Jesse's right is uh, Professor Susan Estridge, who I'm sorry, Estridge, who is a professor at the University of Southern California Law School, and before that was a professor at the Harvard Law School. I think uh, she is probably known to many of you uh, through a variety of appearances on Fox News as a legal and political analyst. You've also may have read her thoughts in a number of the nation's leading newspapers. Uh, she has been on the board of contributors to the Los Angeles Times and USA Today. She's had a distinguished uh, career, including clerking for Justice Stevens of the Supreme Court, serving as a counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I think most relevant to our panel today, she served as a campaign manager for the Dukakis campaign, uh, which was just one of a, a number of her experiences working on presidential campaigns over the last 20 years. She was a graduate of the Harvard Law School and was the first woman editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review and the author of several books, uh, I think one of the most important books in the criminal law in the last 25 years called Real Rape, and, but then also most recently, uh, The Case for Hillary Clinton. Uh, so we'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, directly to my right is uh, Professor Bill Kelly at the Notre Dame Law School where he's been teaching since 1995 and currently serves as the associate dean. He served as a deputy White House counsel from 2005 to 2007, where he worked on the confirmations of Justice Alito and Chief Justice Roberts. He served as an assistant in the Solicitor General's office from 1991 to 1994. And he has clerked for three federal judges, Judge, then Judge Starr of the DC Circuit, Chief Justice Berger, and Justice Scalia. And Bill is also like Susan, a graduate of the Harvard Law School. So what we're going to do is give each panelist 15 minutes to uh, discuss this issue. Then we'll have uh, 15 minutes where they can respond to each other. And then we'll have 30 minutes of questions. So uh, Jesse, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, an interesting and uh, obviously topical issue. Uh, this has been set up to have uh, one person active in Democratic politics and one active in Republican politics <laughs> and uh, I am the independent and uh, therefore uh, uh, therefore uh, I'll try to give some overview uh, I know that the others are going to be wholly objective but you can be wholly objective without being wholly dispassionate uh, and uh, uh, I will be both or at least try let me begin by saying that the, uh, the realistic prospect, uh, no matter who becomes president in, uh, uh, in, uh, for the Supreme Court in the next four years, is unlikely, uh, just unlikely, but, uh, to result in any change in uh, what is in reality, uh, and now has been for three years, uh, not, not the Supreme Court, not the Roberts Court, uh, but the Kennedy Court. Uh, because you have four uh, right-leaning Supreme Court justices, and you have four left-leaning Supreme Court justices, and uh, the successor to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, who held this position for 20 years at least, uh, is, is Justice Anthony Kennedy, right-leaning, uh, uh, but uh, relatively less so as time goes on, and more important, the key uh, swing vote on many, many uh, uh, volatile, controversial, uh, and uh, uh, highly discussed issues, uh, such as recently in the last term, uh, on such issues as uh, uh, the right to an abortion, affirmative action in elementary and secondary uh, education, uh, the 
uh, uh, validity of uh, uh, provisions uh, of the uh, McCain, uh, McCain Feingold uh, campaign regulation bill, and, and, and the, list, the list goes on. Uh, so wh why do I say it's unlikely? Uh, well, I, I would say as between the Republican, or let me, let me just, just, I'm just going to call them liberals and, and conservatives on the court. Uh, between them, the, the liberals are, uh, ha have the, uh, the, <laughs> the uh, advantage or disadvantage of uh, longevity uh, and uh, wisdom. When you're as old as I am, that's the way you think uh, of uh, being old. And uh, in indeed, uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, and you'll forgive me for, for saying this, uh, uh, but uh, this, in this, in 1980, he's going to be 88 years old, uh, and uh, th there, there is a, uh, there is certainly a prospect uh, of his, uh, and, and probably of, 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 the, of the justices, a, a strong, the stronger, the strong, if not the strongest prospect, of uh, being replaced if in, in, in the next four years. Let me say this, and Susan will probably talk more about it, he certainly, uh, he's a role model uh, for guys like me, uh, and, uh, uh, he, um, and, and he, he also uh, shows uh, no inclination, in my judgment, uh, to uh, step down, uh, no matter who becomes uh, president, even though he sits in the liberal camp, and you can draw your own conclusions from that. So that's one of the four uh, liberals on the court. The second oldest, and now, now it becomes pretty close in terms of age, but is often talked about as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who's, uh, I don't know, 14 or 15 years his junior, Justice Stevens is junior, uh, <coughs> but nonetheless a couple of years older than anybody else. And the third, uh, uh, most interestingly, I guess, is Justice David Souter, who's by no means there in, in terms of age, but when people say, has given an indication that he's not happy uh, with the current situation, there's no reason to believe that he'll be any happier the day after the election uh, than he was the day before the election. Uh, so uh, I, I guess it's, it's fair to say the liberals uh, are in greater trouble uh, in respect to the upcoming, uh, the upcoming four years. Uh, the, uh, the three most likely uh, people who will be leaving the court in that period are among the, uh, among the four liberals. Now, uh, that would give the, uh, a, a conservative president an enormous advantage. Uh, it would be the advantage of changing a five to four court to a six to three court. And I am uh, not a mathematician, but uh, it, it is exponentially more difficult uh, at least on the basis of experience, if not mathematics, uh, to get two of the right-leaning ju uh, right justices uh, across, across the line. Uh, and uh, that, that being the case, uh, as I said, uh, that's what you've got to look at uh, when you're looking at the partisan composition of the court and what might happen uh, with the next presidents. The second point that I want to make and uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I fear that most of these are going to be obvious, but this, this, this is not for, uh, a, a discussion tonight for deep uh, philosophic e insights, uh, is, is the fact that the Senate uh, is uh, not as important as who the president uh, will be, uh, but uh, it is uh, of substantial uh, importance, uh, as we have seen uh, over the last uh, seven, eight, years, and indeed more. You can go right into the Clinton administration and uh, see the importance uh, of that. Uh, if uh, the, the president's party uh, were to get uh, 60 solid votes in the Senate, whichever uh, the, uh, the president's party will be, uh, that is a, makes a watershed difference in uh, who, who, who can realistically not simply be nominated to the Supreme Court, uh, but actually uh, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and uh, if, if, if not, and you have a president of one party, 
uh, and a majority, uh, well, if you have 60 of the other party, it's all over, but if you have a majority of the other party, then the failure to have enough votes to get closure uh, is, is quite meaningful and uh, acts as a major uh, bargaining chip, if you will, uh, for the opposition party and also has to play some role. Uh, for some presidents, I think less than others, uh, uh, certainly for, for the incumbent, it, uh, it doesn't appear to have played any great role, but it, I'm sure it plays a role as to the kind of person uh, you're, uh, you're, you're going to nominate. Uh, it's one thing, uh, as seemingly at least, it's a little early uh, in, their, in their tenures, but uh, uh, it's, it's one thing to get uh, people like Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito uh, through the Senate. It's another thing uh, to get someone who has a much more uh, openly partisan reputation on the basis, for example, of experience uh, in the circuit, uh, I, 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 th I think, uh, with, less than 60, uh, with less than 60 votes. So uh, that, that becomes a very important uh, consideration in, in what we're talking about. Uh, so both presidents are going to put some real premium uh, on the following uh, three criteria. Uh, these are also, these are, uh, for, for, for one who follows the situation, it's a, a no-brainer, but they're there. Uh, some, some may put more or less than others, but uh, number one is the gender uh, of the nominee. A uh, woman is certainly going to be looked at hard uh, by both presidents to get someone uh, who's uh, acceptable uh, and uh, backed with some enthusiasm by the president and either party. Second is uh, an Hispanic. Uh, th th this is a very large and growing uh, minority group in the country. We have uh, no Hispanic uh, on, the, uh, on the Supreme Court. A and third would be a, uh, an African American. Now, we have one woman and we have one African-American, but we've had as many as two uh, already. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, there, there is a, um, a certain uh, you owe one uh, effect uh, that's going to take place. I, I, I don't have much doubt about that. Uh, uh, I guess some, well, whatever, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. Uh, so so uh, when, when you're thinking of who uh, but the potential people are, uh, then you've, uh, uh, the potential nominees are, you've got to look hard at those three categories uh, of people. Now let's look at the potential presidents. You know, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it, it's pretty tame uh, in, in a still contested, I mean, in, what is it, uh, February. I think uh, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but to have uh, only three candidates for uh, two positions is uh, not terribly usual. Uh, largely, you know, the, the, I, I think the consequence of, of uh, these early primaries. Uh, but uh, uh, we know, you know, given, given some uh, unforeseen act, uh, that uh, John McCain uh, will be the Republican, uh, re Republican nominee. Well, what kind of people is he going to want to nominate to the Supreme Court. Uh, he, uh, for Republicans in particular, and they're going to be the ones who are in charge of the White House if he gets elected, you know, he's playing a mixed bag. Uh, so the issue is, well, in, in, in which, uh, I don't know whether it's the side of a bag or whatever it is, uh, does uh, a Supreme Court, does the, the nomination of judges uh, fall in? Well, he has the, uh, again, advantage or disadvantage of not being a lawyer. And uh, my, my, my instinct is, and others, uh, I guess one of the reasons a moderate talks first or a, a middle of the road, right? by no means moderate, uh, but, I, but, but, I, uh, I, but I am independent, uh, is, is, is to um, uh, state uh, what I think there's a, a, a general public perception and the insiders will tell us otherwise. Uh, my guess is he hasn't thought a lot. This, this is not, he said, you know, I'm going to appoint people like, uh, like uh, Scalia and Thomas a couple of times. 
uh, uh, but uh, I think he knows even less uh, about that and has been concerned over the years even less uh, than the incumbent who said the same thing. Uh, now, uh, whatever he thought at the time, he's carried through uh, pretty well, pretty well uh, with, uh, uh, with, with that commitment. I think uh, a President McCain uh, would rely very substantially on a group of advisors and have uh, much less input uh, than either of the Democratic nominees would have to whom we're going to come uh, in a moment. But having said that, he, I think he's going to lean on a conservative side in respect to this. This is not the sort of issue uh, that, that uh, he has had. You know, when, when, when immigration was an issue, he had thought a long time about it. Uh, when campaign finance was an issue, he had thought a long time about it. He said that he, I, I don't mean he said, uh, his position has been uh, that, he, that he's pro-life, but his position has also been uh, that when it comes to judicial nominees, he was one of the gang of 14 uh, that finally uh, broke the logjam uh, in the Senate, one of the seven, whatever they are, uh, on each side. You know, one, one, one likes uh, moderates is one way of putting it. So he, he's interested in getting things done in, uh, in, uh, on this particular issue anyway. Uh, so I, I think it's a, I think he's going to he's going to nominate someone who's conservative, but I would say uh, such a person would not be as conservative as the two uh, opposing candidates who've uh, fallen uh, by the way, uh, or the three for that matter. Uh, that, that, that is my own judgment. He's he's less committed on that issue. Uh, how about uh, Obama and Clinton? I think there's very little difference uh, between them in terms of criteria, uh, generally, in terms of knowledge, and so forth. We don't know exactly how left-leaning uh, uh, Senator Obama is, but uh, on general policy issues, there doesn't seem to be much difference between them. So far as uh, uh, Senator Clinton is concerned, uh, that's another matter. Uh, she was quite active in judicial nominations in the White House. That is something that she was active about. Uh, and uh, I think she was quite committed uh, to uh, people uh, probably with more left-leaning inclinations than was the president, uh, than, than Bill Clinton. That's just my own observation as an outsider. So uh, I'm going to give you now, I have about one minute left, and I'll give, I'll give you a quick list. Uh, of uh, some people who I think, uh, and I know a lot less than the other two uh, folks here, who, who are likely nominees. So for the Republicans, if you start on the D.C. Circuit, uh, uh, there's a, a Judge Janice Rogers Brown. A lot of people uh, uh, know who she is. She'd spark a lot of opposition. But uh, with 60 votes, you can tolerate a lot of opposition. Uh, there's uh, uh, Judge Edith Clement uh, on the... Um, uh, on the Fifth Circuit, her name, indeed, on the morning of the nomination, she was a she was the pick, at least to the media. She went to the hairdresser. She she, <laughs> she went to the hair. That's and that is an important criteria, you point out, right? Okay, and uh, uh, third on the on the Fourth Circuit, or at least recently on the Fourth Circuit, is Michael Ludig, uh, who um, uh, left the bench, uh, but is a leading uh, conservative. Uh, fourth is. Uh, 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 Judge uh, Jeff Sutton on the Sixth Circuit, very personable. He, he is a Roberts Alito type, uh, uh, in my judgment, in many, many uh, ways. And fifth, I give you two non-judges, uh, the Solicitor General, Paul Clement, and uh, a sort of long shot is, is uh, someone like Carter Phillips, uh, who was a burger clerk, and I think fairly conservative, and he's the, a leading, if not the leading, uh, Supreme Court uh, advocate uh, in the country. On the Democratic side, from the D.C. Circuit, uh, David Tatel, uh, Judith Rogers, uh, and Merrick Garland. Uh, for, uh, I, I think of uh, uh, the one Hispanic of the whole group, I guess, that I've named is uh, Judge uh, Sonia Sotomayor on the, uh, on the Second Circuit, very highly respected. Uh, if you go to the Ninth Circuit, I got to think of uh, Mrs. Clinton, and that, now that that will make a difference. 
Who do they know? Clinton versus Obama. Uh, Fletcher uh, was appointed by President Cl uh, Clinton to the Ninth Circuit, and he was his campaign manager in Northern California when he ran for president, and was a uh, was a, a, a co. Uh, <laughs> uh, what is the fellowship in? Um, Rhodes. Uh, in in uh, the. Um, Oh, a, a Rhodes Scholar, yeah, co that's it, co Rhodes Scholar uh, with, uh, with, the, with, with President Clinton. And fourth are four law school deans or former deans. So I can say this, right? Uh, uh, I'm not one of them. Uh, uh, I have him here in uh, alphabetical order. Our own dean here, Chris Edley, uh, an African American, very active uh, in, the, uh, in the Obama campaign. Uh, dean Elena Kagan at the Harvard Law School someone who's been active in politics uh, in the Clinton White House. Uh, uh, a third is uh, Harold Coves, the dean of the Yale Law School. I don't know where, someone will tell us uh, where he's been as between Clinton, Clinton. and uh, Clinton. And, and, uh, yeah. and, other, and, and finally, Kath, uh, dean Kath, uh, former Dean Kathleen Sullivan, the Stanford Law School, who's uh, also a Supreme Court advocate and so forth uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, that's my list. and. Uh, uh, I think I may have gone over a few minutes, but nonetheless, I'm done. Uh, well done. Um, I'll take any of those people on that last list. <laughs> They're all my friends. Um, I wanted to make a couple points. First of all, I wanted to describe, just by way of a funny story to start, how I ended up clerking for Justice John Paul Stevens, now viewed as the liberal on the court, but he wasn't back then. And it's a little instruction about how the court works. I was the then much younger, recently elected first woman president of the Harvard Law Review. And I went off to clerk for a man who changed my life. And really, that's what I'm here to talk about today and why I care about the federal judiciary. I went off to clerk for a man named Jay Skelly Wright, who probably most of you in this room have never heard of. But he was a, a hero of another era. He integrated the Louisiana school systems. He integrated the New Orleans school system. He integrated LSU. He had crosses burned on his lawn so often that he used to say to his son in New Orleans, unless the cross is too close to the house, don't call your mother and I and bother us when we're out. You know, if it's close enough to the house to be a hazard, call the fire department. If it's not, ignore it. He had been appointed by the bench to the bench by Harry Truman. He made it to the D.C. Circuit because at the time in the 60s, the Southern Democrats who controlled the Judiciary Committee had made clear that they would not allow him to go on either the Fifth Circuit, which covered the South, or on the United States Supreme Court, even though he was like a few other judges of his time, John Minor Wisdom and all, really one of the men who changed America by their courage. So Jack Kennedy called him up and said, well, they tell me they're going to block you for the Fifth Circuit, and they tell me they're going to block you for the Supreme Court, so how about the DC Circuit? They say you'll stay out of trouble in the DC Circuit. So they appointed him to the DC Circuit, and no sooner did he get there, but he integrated the schools in the District of Columbia and issued the opinion that I read when I was a first year law student called Williams versus Walker Thomas Furniture. I'll never forget it. I was a first year student at Harvard where there was one side and there was the other side. It was all neutral and each side was equal. And then we sat down and read this opinion that said when you're selling furniture to poor people, you can't take advantage of the fact that they're poor to charge them usurious interest rates and then repossess the furniture. And I thought, this is a legal opinion. This is revolution. Who wrote this? And it was this J. Skelly Wright. So I went to work for him. He was a funny guy. He was a quiet man. He had gone to night law school. He was the most courageous person I ever met in my life. And he had this long tradition. He liked to have really smart law clerks because, as he said to me, I don't do the footnotes thing. You know, I do what's just, you do the footnotes. 
So he had figured out that the way to get great footnote writers was to hire you know, the presidents of various prestigious law reviews and have them come and write his footnotes for him. So I got there my first day of work with my co-clerk, who had been the president of the University of Chicago Law School, Law Review. And I had filled out my applications for Supreme Court clerkships. And there was this long tradition in those days that if you clerked for Judge Wright, and you were the president of the Harvard Law Review, you then immediately, without pass and go, clerked for Justice William Brennan, the most liberal justice on the Supreme Court, my other hero from law school, the guy who had written the pioneering decisions on gender discrimination. You know, when you put a woman in a pedestal, you really put her on a cage, all that good stuff. So I was fine. I had my application in. The first day of work, Judge Wright called me into his chambers and said, I have some bad news for you but I don't want you to take it personally. I said, OK. He said, you're not going to clerk for Justice Brennan, but it's nothing personal. I said, I'm not. He said, yeah, but it's not personal. I said, but he went to Harvard, and I went to Harvard, and he took my predecessor, and my predecessor's predecessor, and my predecessor's predecessor's predecessor. He said, it's nothing personal. He just doesn't hire women. <laughs> I said, oh. Oh, nothing personal, right? And he didn't. It was the justice and the boys. Now, for those of you who are my age in this audience, you can remember these days. I mean, where do you go to when the most liberal justice of the United States Supreme Court won't hire you because you're a woman? He said, we'll find you another job. He's hiring your co-clerk from Chicago. I said, from Chicago? He's a conservative, right? I'm the liberal. No. As it turned out, and this is another day's event, the truth was that his secretary liked it to be Justice Brennan and the boys and her. And when Mrs. Brennan died, he married his secretary. And when he married his secretary, she retired and he started hiring women. And when he died, I started telling this story. But the point of the story <laughs> is I turned to just Judge Wright and said, who am I going to clerk for? He said, how about the new boy, Stevens? I said, I understand he's a conservative. He'd been on the Seventh Circuit. He'd issued a decision against women flight attendants. He said, give him a shot. He seems like a good young guy to me. Young, my age then. So I applied to Justice Stevens, who decided to get a jump on his colleagues by being the second person after Brennan to hire that year. And I went to see him, and we had this somewhat awkward conversation, in which he was trying to figure out whether he was too conservative for me. And I was trying to figure out if I was too liberal for him. And we figured, what the hell, we'll give this a shot. Well, that was 30 years ago. And I have remained very close to him over the years. And I say to him laughingly all the time that when I get introduced to forums like this, everybody says, well, she used to clerk for Justice Stevens. And people say, well, of course, the liberal justice. And I have to explain to them, he wasn't the liberal justice back then. It took a lot of work. <laughs> and I used to say to him in recent years, what's happened? How is it that you and I have ended up in the same place? He said, the rest of the world has moved. And I think, unfortunately, there is some truth to that. Has Justice Stevens moved so far to the left, or has the court moved so far to the right? And I think the frank reality from where I sit, having been in this business for 30 years, is that the Ju Justice Stevens has moved some on issues like the death penalty, for instance. He has definitely been shaped by his experience of seeing the way cases are handled on the court. But in a very real way, the court has moved. And one of the reasons the court has moved is because in my other life, running political campaigns, and John was very generous. He only mentioned one of my losers. I have many losers. <laughs> Every Democrat you ever voted for in your life who lost, I worked for. I did two successful Clinton campaigns, but I did Kennedy, I did Carter, I did Mondale, I did Ferraro, I did Dukakis. I mean, I've been there, right? 
And in every one of those campaigns, I have tried, from a position of some significance, to make the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary a voting issue. I have tried, I cannot tell you how many speeches I have written in 30 years about from, from presidential candidates saying, you're not just voting for me. You're voting for the next Supreme. I've done the ads with the pictures of the who will fill these seats. And it never works. It's like trying to get people to vote for vice president. They don't. So the problem, and one of the interesting things to me about this subject tonight, is that from where I sit, who appoints not just the Supreme Court, because I want to raise the issue, and that's the reason I began with Judge Wright, of the federal judiciary going beyond the Supreme Court. Who appoints those people and who those people are are critically important to the freedoms we have as Americans and to the freedoms others have who live in this country and are subject to our laws here and abroad. But try to turn it into a voting issue and it's like banging your head against a brick wall. I have polled it. I have tested it. I have focus grouped it. I have done ads on it. And I have never, when you see a Supreme Court ad on television, it's like seeing the one heartbeat away from the presidency ad. You know the candidates got troubles because they haven't got a winning issue. And that's really too bad. Because it seems to me we are at a very, very critical time. Everybody focuses on the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court is vitally important. But I would make the argument that the most significant thing the next president is going to do may not be to replace Justice Stevens with, hopefully, one of my friends, a former law school dean like Chris Edley, who was my classmate and office mate and very close friend, or Elena Kagan or Kathleen Sullivan, all good friends of mine, all would be wonderful justices. It would be a mitzvah. But the real issue is who's going to appoint these federal district judges and federal courts of appeals judges? And are they going to be people of courage? I have just spent the last couple of years, and I'm still at it. I'm on a red eye tonight to go back and bang my head against the wall some more, representing a, a, a Muslim in Boston who never had anything to do with terrorism, but he's a Muslim in Boston, who's been convicted on tax counts owing <laughs> to a charity he founded 17 years ago when he was a graduate student and hasn't been in existence for God knows how many years. And I have found myself in the federal district courts against prosecutors who, with all due respect, are convinced they are doing the Lord's work in depriving people of fundamental liberties. And our only hope is courageous district judges. And I really do believe that I may not be able to turn it into a voting issue, and it may not make for a great ad, but we are in another one of those time periods not so different from the time period when J. Skelly Wright was sitting in New Orleans with the crosses burning on his lawns, when it is necessary to appoint men and women of courage and determination and integrity to stand up for fundamental rights that are endangered by the war on terror. And so I would simply say to you, as you think about this next election, that to me is very much at stake, and it's more at stake in the day-to-day -day decisions that are made by federal judges about how cases get tried, and who gets detained, and how these things are processed, and made by courts of appeals, than by the relatively, frankly, small handful of decisions that get made by the United States Supreme Court. And as for me, while I've known Hillary Clinton for 30 years, and like her enormously, and am frankly deeply troubled by some of the sexism, dare I say it, that I see out there. I think Barack Obama is an exciting and inspirational candidate, and I am at least optimistic, cautiously optimistic, 
for somebody who has been through 99 losing campaigns. I am cautiously optimistic that some of my friends, some of my former students, maybe some of the people sitting in this room will have an opportunity to show some courage in coming years, which is what we desperately need on the federal bench. Thank you very much. Bill? Good evening. It's great to be here. Uh, I live in Indiana where it's cold and cloudy, and I came to California, and it's cold and cloudy. <laughs> it doesn't seem quite right to me, uh, although I will say, and it's, I'm embarrassed to say this, this is the warmest day I've had since October. And everyone tells me it's terrible here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, as I said, and especially to appear with uh, such distinguished colleagues on this panel. Uh, Throughout my adult life, every presidential election, everyone says, this election is crucial for the history of the Supreme Court. I don't remember any election where that wasn't true. Uh, and I believe it's true again. Uh, there's no question in a world um, where judicial power is so important and so prominent uh, that who sits on the Supreme Court is a very important thing uh, in our republic. Uh, and it's, it's likely, I agree uh, with Jesse, that uh, the next president will fill several seats. Everyone always says that, and then somehow it doesn't seem to happen. Uh, but uh, odds are at least one, and I would guess more than one uh, appointment will be made by the next president, uh, whoever it is. Uh, and I've uh, recently come off an experience where I had some um, role in helping uh, the, the president um, decide whom he was going to pick and then how to get those people confirmed. So I, I'm going to say just a few words about that process uh, and uh, the importance of certain factors in the process, regardless of who's president. Um, the most important thing, I think, uh, that any president has to take account of uh, in making decisions about whom he or she is going to appoint to the Supreme Court is really excellence in the nominee. And there's no substitute uh, for absolute professional distinction in whomever the nominee is. Um, it's very difficult for forces aligned against the president, regardless of whatever party the president's from, um, to successfully oppose a nominee whose professional distinction is really unquestionable. Um, it's, it's just the way the dynamic works. It has worked so far, at least. Uh, and in the case of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, uh, there was no way really reasonably a person could question their excellence. Uh, and that was shown, I think, as well uh, during their confirmation hearings uh, when they performed, uh, well, awesomely. Uh, and that made it very difficult for those opposing the nominations um, to get the traction they needed um, and the political momentum to stop these people from being confirmed. Uh, and with, particularly with Chief Justice Roberts, that was very clear early on because the, the interest groups interested in, in judicial nominations are going to be opposed uh, to the president's pick either side, almost regardless. Uh, if that's not the case, then the president's supporters, regardless of which party the president's from, are going to be disappointed in the nominee. Uh, and it's unlikely that the next president will um, disappoint his or her um, supporters in these picks because they're so important and thought to be and, and acknowledged to be so important. So the key is not to worry about focused interest group opposition to nominees. The key is to make sure that the reasonable middle and the media um, don't um, latch on to the objections. And if a nominee is professionally excellent, and unquestionably so, of unquestioned ethics, of unquestioned um, integrity, uh, unquestioned professionalism, collegiality, it's very hard for the media and for uh, the people who are open-minded about these matters in the political world um, to, to take them down. Uh, and I think that's, that explains the confirmation of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito. It was a remarkable thing to witness uh, that both of these men, who, are, uh, who were obviously very accomplished lawyers and judges, who had served at the highest levels of the legal profession, who had been uh, uh, you know, ambitious, obviously, by definition they're ambitious people, uh, and you couldn't find one person anywhere to say one bad thing about either of them. It's a remarkable thing. It's almost hard to believe. 
but it wasn't like they, people didn't look. And I think that that really explains why they were confirmed. Um, and I think, uh, unfortunately, it also explains um, how the traction against the nomination of Harriet Myers became so strong, because she was perceived to be of less excellence, wrongly in my own view. Um, uh, but nonetheless, she was perceived not to have the excellence that we now demand of Supreme Court justices. This is, this is a new development in our system. It didn't used to be the case um, that uh, Supreme Court justices had to be legal giants. Many were politicians. Um, no one, uh, with all due respect, would have described Chief Justice Warren as a legal giant. He was a political giant, and he turned into a legal giant uh, as, as Chief Justice of the United States. But uh, today, uh, someone with Chief Justice Warren's background would face serious objections on the merits uh, in, in, the, in the process. And it's interesting to, to hear uh, my colleagues up here talk about potential nominees, uh, um, and among them, people who aren't sitting judges. Uh, I am personally, my, my own view is that, uh, that non-sitting uh, judges ought to be considered, and, and it would be a good thing to open up the field. Uh, of Supreme Court appointments to people who, who aren't boring Court of Appeals judges. Um, but it's going to be hard to do that successfully. I think it's going to be very hard uh, to get uh, law school deans, of the, even of the distinction of Dean Edley or, or Dean Sullivan or Dean Kagan, um, uh, through the process because although they're professionally excellent, they're different and they're not our image of Supreme Court justices anymore. Um, and I think that's going to be a hurdle to overcome. We're also going to be on the record on lots of controversial issues, which will provide ammunition to those who, would, who might oppose their nominations. Um, and, and I don't count myself among those who would oppose, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not taking any position on the nomination of any person. Um, but it's inevitable that whoever the president is, there's going to be opposition to, to, to his or her nominations. Um, professional excellence, is, I think, is the key. It also is very important um, to have uh, support in the Senate. The role of the Senate in the judicial uh, process, the judicial nomination and confirmation process, both at the inferior court level and the Supreme Court level, is, is just crucially important. I agree uh, with, with Susan about this point. Um, it, it wasn't nothing, obviously, that the Republicans had 55 seats in the Senate when uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito went, went through the process. Now, Jesse has said that 60 votes is a key marker uh, in the process uh, uh, of picking and confirming a justice. And that's true, um, but it didn't really used to be true. We don't have a tradition in this country of uh, filibustering judicial nominations of any sort, and particularly Supreme Court nominations. Requiring a cloture vote on a Supreme Court nominee is an extraordinary thing. It's happened now twice, and once it was a serious uh, objection. Um, and it was a serious issue when, when Justice Fortas was nominated to be Chief Justice. Uh, they, they did require a cloture vote for Justice Alito's confirmation, um, but it didn't get a lot of traction. Um, it, uh, my own view is that it's not a good thing for the system uh, to escalate to that level. Uh, and we're at a point where neither side um, defers in any way to the president's prerogatives uh, in judicial appointments. That's both true, it's true of both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and we've seen an escalation in the last 15 years of uh, tactics opposing judges' uh, confirmations because uh, we tend to now to perceive them as having uh, more of a political role than a legal role than they used to have. Uh, and I'm going to say a few words about uh, lower court nominations. Um, there's no question that in the day-to-day -day administration of justice in this country, the, the judges on the courts of appeals and the district courts um, have enormously important influence and much more day-to-day -day influence than Supreme Court justices. Uh, and who fills those seats is obviously very important. There's a huge distinction, though, between Court of Appeals nominations and District Court nominations. Uh, and that does, that does involve the role of the Senate. For District Court nominations, um, the incumbent president um, uh, is bound to listen very closely to the um, uh, interests and desires of home state senators. Uh, and it's the Senate's practice that without the uh, agreement of both home state senators for a district court nominee, um, that nomination dies. So if you want judges of courage who will, who will give you results that you like, it's very important to, to work on the Senate side on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, and indeed, in some ways, more important 
than worrying about uh, the, uh, the president. Um, the, 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 the truth is that home state senators have as much influence over district court nominations as does the president. Um, on the Court of Appeals side, and I think this is true of judicial nominations generally, it's very important not only who the president is, but who uh, the president's staff is. Uh, different presidents organize judicial selection in different ways, and I don't know how Senator McCain or Senator Obama or Senator Clinton would, would, would organize judicial selection. But there's no doubt, of course, that the president is going to take advice on these matters. It can't be otherwise, um, uh, at least practically speaking. Probably less true of Supreme Court nominations, and I think particularly, I agree, on the Democratic side, I think either candidate will have um, his or her own views on those matters independently of whatever the staff might think. Uh, I don't think that's true of Senator McCain. I agree about that. Um, but who the staff is matters. Now, if Senator Obama becomes president, it, it won't matter because everyone's going to agree on everything, and, and, and it will be a consensus, and all, all will be wonderful in the world. Um, so it doesn't matter, actually, so much who his staff is. But in fact, I got to say, I'm guessing that Senator Obama's staff, if he becomes president, will be partisan Democrats, even if he's not. Um, I actually believe he is, of course. Uh, and, and he would agree, I'm sure, if he were here. It's just a different kind of partisanship. Um, his staff should be partisan Democrats. Uh, and, and that's the way it ought to be. Uh, and they're going to have their own um, views about who would be good judicial candidates. Uh, and, and that's important in, in advising any president. Uh, and, and that's true of, of whoever, uh, obviously, the president is. Um, so when, when we think about not only uh, who the president is, the, 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 the way the executive branch is staffed um, is as important. Uh, there is there's enormous work to be done in the executive branch and the departments and agencies. Uh, and, and the staff that the president brings has enormous influence, therefore. Um, on, on the confirmation side, on uh, the lower courts, um, I don't, uh, I think describing the need for, for lower court judges um, to be people of courage is exactly right. Now, we might disagree, um, Susan and I, about what that means in particular cases. Uh, any president really needs to be uh, focused on making sure that whoever the judges become are people who are going to be true to their oaths who are going to decide the cases on the merits, who aren't going to be cowed by public pressure, who are going to be independent judicial actors. Now, obviously, a Republican president or a Democratic president are going to um, expect and look for different judicial philosophies, approaches to law. But they oughtn't to be looking, I think, for particular re outcomes and results. They should be looking for judges who will decide the cases according to their best lights, regardless of who the parties are and regardless of what the issues are. Um, in the Court of Appeals um, confirmation wars of the last uh, 15 years, um, we've seen a degradation of relations. Uh, and that's a new and different thing. You know, it, it is true that throughout our history, um, there have been uh, numerous Supreme Court nominations that have failed in the Senate. Uh, it's really only in the last uh, generation that on inferior court nominations, there's been concerted opposition to the president's picks, regardless of party. The Republicans misbehaved during the Clinton administration, delayed folks, some folks for too long, unconscionably. Um, but they didn't vote very, anybody down on the Court of Appeals level, as a matter of fact. No, nobody was not confirmed who got a vote. There were some who le were left unconfirmed, as had been the case with President Bush 41's judicial nominees and President Clinton's and President Carter's, except for Stephen Breyer, of course, who remarkably was nominated and confirmed to the First Circuit after President Carter lost the election. I did his thing. There you go. <laughs> um, this is, this is. Well, think, well, just consider. Kind of deal. Yeah, cons exactly. Consider where we are. Consider where we are in the Court of Appeals context when 28 years ago we have an uh, excellent nominee to the First Circuit nominated and confirmed after the incumbent president and his party have lost the election. That is a remarkable thing. And obviously, it couldn't possibly happen today. Trump. Well, yes. I was there. <laughs> um, but of course, the Republicans didn't believe that it was essential to stop that, because the, the, the perceived role of the Court of Appeals judge was not just to do whatever political bidding of the day was, was, was afoot. Um, and in, you know, beginning in, I think, the Bush years, well, really the Reagan years, there was more focus on judicial lower court nominations. Um, and then 
in the Clinton years, things degraded. Uh, and then in the Bush uh, 43 years, things degraded even more. Uh, the first set of Court of Appeals nominees uh, submitted by President Bush included two um, nominees of President Clinton, one of whom had been recess appointed uh, to the Fourth Circuit, Roger Gregory. Now, in the world of interbranch relations, recess appointment of a judge, a Court of Appeals judge, is extremely impolite. It's about as impolite as things get. And still, he was nominated and confirmed very quickly. Um, but that's, that, that was the high watermark. And I have to say, and maybe this is a partisan point, um, that gesture by President Bush was not met in kind. Uh, and within a couple years, we had 10 filibustered Court of Appeals nominees, which was unprecedented in the history of the Republic. And we're at a, we're at a point now, if a Democrat wins the White House, where we really need to decide how to stand down. I don't see how it can happen, because interest groups are involved, and uh, a lot's at stake, and it's very hard to lay down arms in this kind of battle. Um, the, uh, the final point I'll make is about the politics of, of judicial selection. Um, it, it, it is the case, I think it's accurate, and, and obviously um, Susan is extremely experienced in these matters, and I'm not, um, that, that people don't vote on the judges as an, as, as, an, as an issue. But you know, they did in 2002 in the Senate, Senate campaign. And the Democratic um, perceived obstructionism of the Court of Appeals nominees um, is widely thought, and I think properly thought, to have been a factor, a significant factor, in the, Senate, the Democrats' loss of the Senate in that election, and in particularly in the majority leader of the Senate's loss of his reelection, uh, Senator Daschle from South Dakota. Um, and that, that's, uh, this is an issue, judges, that does tend to energize Republicans, I think, more than Democrats. At least that, that is my perception. Um, I don't know why that is, uh, because it's, it's very, I also perceive that, that Democrats um, tend to want more from judges than Republicans. Um, uh, Republicans, the conventional wisdom is, want judges to be conservative and decide according to the law, that's what they'll say. And Democrats, of course, will say they want them to decide according to the law as well. But according to the law, tends to be outcomes that they like. Uh, and for some reason, it doesn't energize Democrats, Democratic voters the way it does, it seems at least in recent years, seems to have energized Republican voters. I think in this coming election, um, it's, it's possible that, that there will be more traction on this question. Um, although I have to guess, I, I do have to defer to the greater wisdom of Professor Estrich on these questions. Um, so I'll stop there uh, and, and say that, you know, I don't know who the, who the president's going to be, obviously. Um, but one thing is clear, whoever it is, the action is going to be in the United States Senate. Uh, the president can make all the decisions he or she wants about who the nominees will be. Thank you. Um, if anyone has questions, please uh, hand in the cards now because we're going to start the discussion and like to collect the question cards during that period. Um, I don't know if anyone has responses or points to make in uh, response to what they've heard. I just had one and it relates to the abortion issue and why it is. I think there's, I'm so used to, I was joking with John a little bit. I teach at USC, and I'm the house liberal at Fox News. So I said to him, you and I should just switch places, right? I could be very comfortable here. And you could be very comfortable in some of the places I sit. But my guess is a lot of those in this audience agree with me on the fundamental right of women to freedom of choice. And yet, we have not succeeded, I think particularly with younger women, and I know there's an awful lot of us of a certain generation here. We have not succeeded, particularly with younger women, in either educating, convincing, persuading, or moving them to see that they have an enormous interest in the judiciary of the United States and in the judiciary's role in the protection of their most fundamental constitutional rights. And I have gotten to the point where I'm old enough that I can remember when I was in college and we used to, I went to college in Massachusetts where abortion was illegal. 
and we used to collect money to send girls on buses to New York where abortion was legal in California and in New York, and they would come back occasionally hemorrhaging. And the issue would be, do you go to the local hospital and what do you say when they ask you, why is this woman bleeding? And there is an entire generation that, in a sense, thanks to the Supreme Court and thanks to our success, looks at me like I'm from Mars when I tell them these stories. And I have occasionally thought that we have been sometimes you know, too successful for our own good. That there is an entire generation of young people that don't know what it's like, really, if you're American born and middle class or upper middle class, and particularly if you live in a place like California, to not have fundamental constitutional protections and not be free to exercise fundamental choice. And it's not that I want to see bad things happen to nice people. But I think one of the reasons the Supreme Court has not been a voting issue in recent elections is because people like me have so many times gone out there and said, if we lose this election, we're going to lose Roe v. Wade. And then we lose the election, and we don't lose Roe v. Wade. At least we don't if we're upper middle class college students in protected enclaves in major cities like Berkeley. The people who have lost Roe v. Wade live in rural communities across America in states where there's no provider of abortion, where, you know, in North Dakota and South Dakota and places like that. And so in some sense, we have been the beneficiaries of our own success. When I talk about the importance of the federal judiciary, I'm not worried about me, all right? Most of us in this audience who are white and middle class and upper middle class, we're fine. But it's the disadvantaged. I mean, the Supreme Court has always been, and the federal courts have always been, the people who speak out for the, the, against the tyranny of the majority. And while I disagree with John on many issues, I fundamentally believe in, in fundamental freedoms for everybody. And that's what I see is at stake here. Jessica. I want, I want to make two, two quick points, one, one for Susan. First, uh, it's very unlikely uh, that uh, you'll, you'll get a, an overturning uh, of uh, Roe against Wade uh, by the present court. That, that's my judgment uh, very clearly. Uh, I th and it's fairly unlikely that even though I, I believe that there are five there who would not have voted for it in the first place, uh, uh, nonetheless, at least two or three, I shouldn't say at least, two or three uh, would not overturn it uh, today. So I, I think the, the main difference in the Supreme Court will be going forward and not going backward, uh, if you will, although there are ways to distinguish cases, which we saw in the last term, without uh, and doing so honestly, without overruling him. Second, the notion of excellence in the nominees. Uh, fortunately, it is a key, but I tell you, it is no guarantee. Uh, there was no more, uh, uh, there was no more qualified a nominee uh, than Robert Bork uh, when he was knocked off uh, back uh, in, in the Reagan administration. I'm not saying he was knocked off for the wrong reasons at all. Uh, he was knocked off because of his ideological point of view. Given uh, the role of Supreme Court justices today, I must say I don't think that's illegitimate. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of basic, he was out there. That is the difference, uh, I think, between Chief Justice John Roberts right. and uh, Judge Samuel Alito. Uh, they're, they're, they're not. They, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't stick them uh, with very much, and uh, nor, nor, nor could you in the confirmation hearing. They, they were very well prepared. Although, yeah. you, <laughs> although, you had, although you had two people, you know, who uh, I, it would be, be a pleasure to have to prepare them, it seems to me. It was a pleasure to help. <laughs> um, well, I used to tease both of them that they're being accorded legal genius status for being able to recite doctrine. Because uh, that's all they did, right? They recited doctrine from memory, uh, and, and uh, they did it very, very well uh, and eloquently. And 
Um, and look who they were up against. Senators. I mean, they're not, you know. <laughs> It's uh, true. There's something it's true. Well, I do think uh, senators playing law professors is. Yeah. I mean, we shouldn't play senators. They should play us. There's, there's a lot to that, actually. I, I agree with that. That the um, the way that the confirmation hearing process is set up, um, if a nominee is shrewd and careful, uh, it's very easy to to make it work to to his or her advantage. Um, it's a very unusual thing for a lawyer for the clock to be your friend, for example. And the way that the Senate divides time, the time for each senator to question is short. Uh, so you, for the law students among you, um, you, you will learn that when you're in court, um, you never have enough time to say what you want to say. And, and part of legal judgment is knowing what arguments are worth making, uh, to, leaving to the brief, and w which ones you need to, to make in the argument, uh, because time is so short. Well, for a nominee to the Supreme Court, the longer you talk, the less they talk. Uh, and uh, and it's also very important, the longer they talk, the less you talk. So there's really a no-lose situation as long as you're careful. Um, for, for, a nom for a senator, I'm not going to name any names because uh, you know, I don't want to make enemies. Um, but for a senator who's shrewd and careful and smart and, 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 and adaptive, uh, a nominee really ought to kind of filibuster. But for a senator who likes to hear himself so talk, talk. <laughs> let him go. Let him go, and the clock is gone. And, and, and Joe and Biden, we both said the same name. <laughs> and I like Joe, but it's, yeah. you know. Um, now, I, I wanna, I'll just say, make one other point. Um, we are at a place um, in our judicial selection process and confirmation process both on the Supreme Court and on the inferior courts, where we are um, forcing uh, nominees uh, into, boring is the wrong word, but it's kind of milk toast. Um, one of the, I mean, the key difference, obviously, between uh, Judge Bork and the Chief Justice and Justice Alito is that Judge Bork had a long record of, uh, and clear record on every, every co um, uh, controversial issue known to humankind. And he couldn't get away, therefore, in his confirmation hearings with not talking about stuff. And that's what did him in, because he was, he, I think he was perceived as being uh, much more interested in the intellectual game of law rather than deciding cases. Um, and he was perceived as you know, being likely to decide cases in a way that a majority of the Senate thought was going to be uncongenial. Um, it's true on the lower courts as well now. In the 1980s, we had very easily confirmed to the courts of appeals people like Richard Posner and Frank Easterbrook, um, who are both excellent judges. Uh, and, and, and under Democratic presidents, we've had people like Steve Reinhart and, and Nathaniel Jones and Jay Skelly Wright, uh, who is a giant and a hero, um, confirmed to, to seats on the courts of appeals without significant opposition or controversy. And that won't happen anymore because we're now at a point where the vote in the Senate really has no deference to the president, regardless of party, built in. Uh, today, someone like uh, Judge Reinhardt would be very difficult to get confirmed. Uh, and someone like Judge Easterbrook would be equally difficult to get confirmed. And I think the federal judiciary is much impoverished for that on both sides. Uh, and, and you see, and this is based on my own personal experience, you know, from 2005 to 2007, I interviewed every candidate for every uh, Article III judgeship uh, that was open, uh, unless I was absent for some day. But, but that was part of my job. Uh, and we had lots of people, good people, who would be terrific judges say, I'm not putting myself and my family through this. Why would I do that? Yeah, it's public service, and it would be a good thing to do, and I could contribute to the well-being of the republic. Uh, but it's not worth the cost to my family of going through that process. Uh, and that's a, bad th that's a bad thing, and it's going to be true on both sides of the aisle going forward in a way that we really ought to worry about, regardless of politics. Uh, and that's why I worry so greatly about um, the continued escalation of the confirmation process in the Senate. Because the partisan in me, I'm a Republican, um, if a Democrat is president, I don't want them to easily confirm um, folks to the courts of appeals in a partisan way. That's, not, that's, that's my reaction. That's my instinct. I'll be honest with you. Um, and it's certainly the reaction instinct, I'm guessing, of, of Professor Estrich uh, on the other side. Um, but boy, we'd all be better off if 
both sides within reason, within reasonable limits, let folks who they might not like through? Actually, I, I so strongly agree with you on, on one point. I think it, it points where it matters. You need people of stature. Because people of stature are more likely to do courageous things. And I think the one problem, the big problem we have right now is that if you want to be a judge, if that's really your goal, then the best thing to do is keep your nose clean, you know, work in government service, don't take controversial positions. It's almost like the European model of a professional judiciary. And that's all well and good. But when it comes to those moments when you need somebody who's willing to say no to power, which is what federal judges need to do sometimes, that's their ultimate authority, is to say no to power, no to the US government, no to Congress, no to governors. You cannot do this. It takes people of stature to do that. It takes people who have independent bases. It takes people who know that when push comes to shove, they cannot be intimidated. They cannot be pushed aside. They are sufficiently respected that if they are then attacked in the US Senate or anywhere else, they will be defended. And one of the things I worry about is not that I'm such a big Bork fan, I wasn't involved in that fight. But I remember saying to some of my friends when they were getting ready to take on Bork, I said, if we kill Bork, if you guys kill Bork, you've killed all of us too. Because we're all his mirror. And I think there is a danger right now that, you know, we were talking about the law school deans. I would like to see one of those law school deans on the court because they're people of courage and they're people with independent bases of authority and autonomy, which allow them to stand up and do what's right, even if it's not what's popular. I like to see people like that on district courts. I like to see people like that on courts of appeals. And if we get milk toasts on both sides, we'll get people who are afraid of the bad headline in the paper, of the protest in front. And that's not what we need. Most federal, you know, I'm now practicing law. A lot of cases are X versus Y, and there's a statute, and you construe it, and you hope the judge reads the brief, and he comes down, or she comes down, and that's the end of the day. Fine, it doesn't matter all that much if they're a Bush appointee or a Clinton appointee. You just want somebody competent and sane who reads, right? <laughs> I mean, it's true. But there are important moments when you want somebody who is willing to stand up and say, actually, no. The government is saying they need the right to do this. The government is saying they have to be able to do this. The government is saying that the fate of the free world depends on locking up Japanese in camps. It doesn't. No. And that's when you need people of stature. And I worry that what both sides have done in this fight is made a lot of people of stature into untouchables. And I will occasionally run into somebody who says to me, who I'll approach on a case or a this or a cause, and they say, oh, I couldn't go near that. You know, you've given up your hopes of confirmation, but I haven't yet. I gave them up years ago. Um, and I think that's really too bad. I think we shouldn't be in a position where people sort of, in order to take an unpopular position, you have to literally look at yourself in the mirror and say, so I'm unconfirmable. Ah, it's life. I'd vote for you. Yeah, well. <laughs> That's just one. You vote. might not get a chance. <laughs> right. Actually, um, the first question, which follows up on what Susan was just talking about, and it'd be interesting to hear um, what the other two panelists think of that, what Susan just said is, um, and this is says this thing says it's from a law student, pure and simple. Is how would you become an appellate court or a Supreme Court judge now, given the environment that you just described? What what does one do in order to become qualified but not controversial? Well, I I, I think there's degrees of uh, 
staying away from anything that has any potential controversial nature. So um, on the one hand, on the other hand, when you, when you go into something which is high visibility and which almost, I, I remember talking to Ken Starr before he took that independent prosecutor thing. And I said, it's a no-win situation. You were right. Uh, and uh, well, to, you know, to his great credit, I think he's a public servant, he's going to do it. Uh, he was high on the list, uh, but uh, no, 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 no. Uh, fell. Now he's uh, in Pepperdine. It's pretty. Yeah, fell, to the <laughs> fell to the bottom. But I, 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 would, I would like to somewhat modify the notion that, you know, you've got to stay away from everything because I think, that, A, that's essentially impossible, and B, um, I think at least some degree of um, speaking out has got to, uh, uh, has got in the, in the end to be able to be trumped by excellence, as you put it. Um, I, in some ways, I regret that a law student asked that question um, because the, my first reaction is, um, boy, you're in for a tough career if, if you start with that ambition. Um, because uh, it's, it's just so unlikely to happen to anybody uh, um, that, that you're almost bound to fail in your ambition. Um, so you, know, you don't know what you want to do with your, with your legal career yet and, and, and see, see where it takes you. That's my first, first answer. Um, practically speaking, you have to do enough. Um, first of all, you have to be really good. I'm going to assume really being a really good lawyer. Second, you have to do enough to get noticed, but not so much that you get noticed by the other side. Um, I'm, I actually mean that. Uh, um, you don't want to uh, you know, arouse uh, 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 enmity from people uh, who are partisans of the other party, whatever your party is. Um, in that sense, I quite agree with Jesse that, that it, it is a huge mistake to order one's career around being confirmed by the United States Senate for anything. Do what you want, do what you think is right, do your best job, make the, sh make the calls as you see them, and don't worry about the confirmation consequences, because that really is um, empty. It's so unlikely to come to pass, and there are a lot, it's a lot more noble to have a career of distinction and courage and contributions uh, and not be confirmed by the Senate. And you can always teach law. Which is a way better job. Um, and finally, if you want to be a district court judge, you better know your home state senators. That's, that's a very practical point. I'm going to uh, combine these last two questions here um, in the interest of time. Both of them have to do with ways to improve the process. So one person asks um, that, Sandra, I believe this is correct, Sandra Day O'Connor was the last justice to hold elective office. Um, it's been very rare since President Eisenhower. And I think the suggestion here is wouldn't it be a good idea if presidents were to start appointing uh, elected politicians to the Supreme Court rather than lower court judges. Second uh, question says, why don't we change the uh, Supreme Court term to, from life to a limited term, say 10, 15 years, then would we worry so much about who was on the Supreme Court if we knew they would be replaced at a regular interval by both parties? What was the first one again? I, 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 well, elected elected oh, politicians. I, I think it would be good to have politicians on the court. Really good. When I first went to work for Stevens, he had, it was his second year on the court. And I'm a political beast. So I used to schmooze all the clerk's chambers. In fact, he was the junior justice. I mean, he got the worst opinions, you know, whatever. So I'd schmooze around and figure out what was really going on. And I'd come back and tell him stories. I'd say, you know how Stewart just stole Blackman's court on Royal Drug? Now, nobody in the world remembers Royal Drug, but Royal Drug was a business of insurance case that one of our crazy co-clerks who went on to be the dean of the University of Chicago Law School was determined to steal Blackman's court. It was 5-4 at conference, got assigned to Stewart for the dissenting opinion got assigned to Blackman for the majority opinion. Stewart's clerk says, I'm going to steal this from Blackman. 
call comes in from the Rehnquist chambers to the Stewart chambers on the same day, a major Fourth Amendment decision is coming down, is getting circulated in the Rakes case about standing for passengers and cars. And Rehnquist says to Stewart, I hope you'll keep an open mind about my opinion in Rakes, which was a really bad case. And Stewart says to Rehnquist, I hope you'll keep an open mind to my opinion in Royal Drug. And Rehnquist, who was a very smart guy and very political, turns to his clerks and says, if you'll pardon my French, what the fuck is Royal Drug, right? <laughs> And his clerk says, Royal Drug is the business of insurance exception to the McCarran-Ferguson Act, where Stewart is trying to steal Blackman's court. Rehnquist says to his clerks, I'm by then in that chambers, he says, I don't care. Royal Drug, I don't want Stewart's vote on Rehnquist. And so later the same day, the memo comes around, and it's from Rehnquist saying, after careful consideration of Brother Stewart's carefully reasoned opinion in the royal drug case, I have come to the conclusion that I voted in error in conference. And I am now switching my vote from Justice Blackman to Justice Stewart. And Stewart gets his opinion in royal drug, which no one in the world has ever cared about before or since, other than the royal drug company. And later the same day, Rakes comes around, and Justice Stewart says, I was initially uncertain, but I am now now fully persuaded by Justice Rehnquist's powerful opinion in the Rakes case. And I go rushing into Justice Stevens and say, yes, say? And I say, there's politics on the court. He says, I'm shocked. <laughs> and I said, you got to work the hallway. You got to go up and down. You got to work these guys. You got to do like Rehnquist does. You don't care about this case. You do care about that case. You trade this one. I said, what we need around here is politics. It's still five votes. Now, you may think this is the first time I've told that story, but actually it isn't. The first time I told that story was I was having a long conversation one day with Bill Clinton many, many years ago, saying you need politicians on the Supreme Court. It's still about getting five votes. And while the way you do your politics is different than saying, I'll build a dam in Tennessee if you'll build an air base in, you know, Missouri, it's still politics. So, you know, Clinton later said to me, he tried to put Cuomo on the court and Babbitt on the court. I mean, he was a big believer that there was a value to having people who, as they say, know how to count to five in this case. And I do believe that. I think that there is nothing inconsistent with fundamental values in recognizing that fundamental values aren't so good when one person believes them. They're a lot better when five people believe them. So I'm all for putting um, uh, politicians on the court. I think you need people who have had some experience. I also think and I don't know how others come down on this, but one of the areas where the court has been so stunningly naive as to be ridiculous is the whole area of campaign finance law and the First Amendment. And I think one piece of the problem is none of these guys, except for Steve for 15 minutes, Steve Breyer for 15 minutes in 1980, and he was nervous the whole time because he was chief counsel of the Judiciary Committee. None of these guys have been in campaigns. So they have these absurd notions like, quote, independent committees. Right. And you know, I mean, that, that they don't understand the corrupting role of money in politics and therefore view it from a sort of ivory towered perspective of speech rather than understanding. I mean, I jokingly say I'm the only person that I know of who has ever both taught election law for 20 years and signed FEC forms. And it's a terrifying experience because usually when you sign an FEC form, you say, see no evil, hear no evil, no, no evil, sign here, right? I'm gonna violate every law and I don't know, so you can't put me in jail. And you know, I knew what I was violating every law and I did it anyway. Um, so I do believe that you need politicians. I think the law would be better on campaign finance if we had some people with political experience. I do not believe in limited tenures. And the reason I don't believe in limited tenures in 10-year terms and 15-year terms or anything like that 
is the same reason I want people of stature and the same problem I have here in California when I see judges running for office or trying to stay in office. I think there is something about saying to a person, you have this job for the rest of your life. Now do it. Nothing's going to happen to you. No one can take it away. This is your time to grow and see who you are. And I have seen, whether it's with Justice Stevens or Hugo Black or others, people really grow into this role in an amazing way. I think David Souter has grown into his role. So that's what I think. Well, I was in favor of politicians until I heard that story, <laughs> which, which I view as actually horrifying, frankly. Uh, and, well, there you go. Um, uh, and in my own experience, I have to say, I've, I've, never, I've never seen a judge um, trade votes do, do log rolling. Trade a deep consideration. Log rolling like Go that is, is, you know, um, having said that, though, uh, you know, I, I think we ought to be open to uh, uh, members of the, of the Supreme Court from places other than the United States Courts of Appeals. Uh, it, it's a recent phenomenon in our history where that is the uniform spot from which these people come. Uh, I'm thinking more than half of the justices uh, in our history um, were appointed from someplace other than the U.S., other than a judgeship, actually. So it used to be quite common. Um, and I think that, that, that that's a perfectly fine thing. Um, it's going to be tough uh, in our current political environment to get such people confirmed, particularly politicians who have voted a lot, because that makes for easy politics to caricature people's views or not, actually, to, to you know, forthrightly portray their views, either way. Um, and I think as a political matter, it's going to be a, a challenge uh, to get politicians, uh, elected officials, uh, on the court. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, John doesn't believe that, but it's true. I will be brief. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, it would be an excellent idea to have people from different walks of life. It was mentioned that I, I clerked for Justice, uh, Chief Justice Warren. Uh, it was because he brought a perspective to the resolution of problems that do fully involve judgment. Virt virtually all constitutional interpretation does. And uh, he, he brought a, a wisdom and an experience and an instinct. I often said he'd have been a greater president even uh, than he was uh, Chief Justice. Or straight out of practice, like Lewis Powell, who was a, a very fine uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, who came from a distinguished uh, law practice. So, and, and the fact that some of our greatest judges uh, were, uh, had, had, were, weren't on the Court of Appeals. And I, I mean, you know, it's from the 30s, Charles Evans Hughes. Uh, uh, when, the, when I uh, was uh, clerking, uh, Hugo Black, uh, uh, William O. Douglas, at least in his younger days, uh, uh, were, were uh, really uh, outstanding people. And they did so on the basis uh, of, uh, of a, a Felix Frankfurter uh, as well. Uh, as, as, uh, pardon? Byron White. And uh, yeah, Byron White was a, was a very good judge, a very good judge, uh, uh, justice. So, fa so far as life tenure is concerned, uh, I'm against it. I would be in favor of limiting tenure. I'm not in favor of doing anything that's going to interfere with judicial independence. But I think there are ways for Supreme Court justices uh, to make the term long enough and the uh, alternatives after, uh, after uh, uh, serving uh, attractive enough uh, to, uh, uh, to do it. You make a 20-year term. Uh, I, I think that's enough. I, I, I'm really distressed with the criterion of, uh, not because I'm old, but, but uh, young, you know, you, 50 years old. We don't, we don't want anyone who's, who's, uh, we would like, uh, who's under 50, uh, over 55 uh, to be nominated to the court. I think that's a big mistake. And uh, the Republicans have done it mainly so far, but I think the Democrats are probably going to start uh, as, uh, as well. There are ways to guarantee independence uh, without, uh, uh, without guaranteeing a uh, lifetime appointment. But I think it would take a constitutional amendment unlike uh, a big push going on in certain circles uh, in academics uh, to uh, have a, uh, uh, a scheme for limiting, limiting terms. Uh, so that's what I think. I'm afraid we're uh, out of time. I, I hope you all join me in thanking this uh, wonderful panel.